Good evening, everyone. This is the East Aurora Union Free School District Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, December 15th. We are returning from executive session where we discussed matters related to the employment of a particular person, employment history of three particular employees, matters related to the employment of a particular corporation, and three matters related to the employment of a particular person's corporations. And uh, we do not have any agenda changes tonight, so I'm moving right on to item five, superintendent's comments. Um, okay, I have two comments tonight uh, to share with you. Uh, first, um, we mentioned the uh, addition of a unified sports program. Um, and so we're moving ahead. And so we're very pleased and we'll be bringing you hopefully within the next uh, four meeting or so some, some, some members to one to be a coach and one to be a, an advisor for the club. Uh, so it's moving along nicely. Uh, the first sport we'll be doing for unified sports is basketball. And that takes place in the late spring. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Marinaccio, um, Mr. Mabretti, the, the, uh, the principals have really worked uh, hard to make this happen, so we're very grateful. Uh, I think it's going to be a great program for our kids, and so we'll have a presentation probably on uh, as we get closer to appointing uh, the, uh, the coach and the club advisor uh, to that sport. Uh, and then the other, the other piece I wanted to share, I'm really Glad we've been working on the agreement with the SRO, uh, with the town and village, and we've come to an agreement. Right now, we're in the process of just kind of finalizing the contract between the village and, and the school district. So I just want to thank uh, the mayor, Pete Mercurio, um, our supervisor, Jim Bach, uh, all the members of their boards uh, for their cooperation in making it happen. We're really looking forward to bringing in SRO uh, as soon as possible. So that will take a little while, but we're really looking forward um, in the next month or so to have somebody on board with us. So I just want to thank them again. And that's it. All right, thank you very much. Moving on to board presidents and board member comments and committee reports. Um, on November 30th, the district policy committee met. Uh, Mr. Brunson and Mr. Cassidy and I participated as board members. Um, we are recommencing the policy review process after a pandemic delay, which is Nice to see getting moving again. We're currently in the process of moving our policies to board docs with the assistance of BOCES. The intention, intention right now is to start with the required policies. Uh, that means policies that are required by law, regulation, or the comptroller. BOCES is working with us to review all the policies and help us keep track of what is needed. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Miss Dan Mrs. Daniel, not Mr. Brunson, on the committee. Thank you. Um, BOCES reviews all the policies and helps us keep track of what's needed. They're amazingly organized about it, and we have fantastic spreadsheets of what we have and what is needed, um, and they will help us work through the process of updating as they have for years past. Um, to that end, we have four required policies on for review tonight. Did I miss anything, Mr. Cassidy or Mrs. Daniel? Thank you, Mr. Mambretti. That's it from me tonight. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Sanders. Um, I had a safety meeting on December 10th along with um, Ms. Malice and Mrs. Daniel. Um, and on some of the issues that I need to just bring to your attention was that the teachers in our buildings are also keeping their windows open to increase the ventilation. The technology um, department will be getting a new web filter known as iBoss. And that is something that should um, continue to help with um, our students in the technology and that will be coming as soon as our new technology director starts in January. Um, Parkdale. Parkdale's had some concerns with their age shortages and that deals with the supervision, nurse age, and just generally in coverage. Now that there's two different lunches because they have to split up because of numbers, um, they've had difficulty getting full coverage for those. Although Mr. Brown did just say, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Mrs. Uh, Tahani just said that um, that they were going to hopefully have two more new hires, and that should alleviate some of the issues with that. There was a question during our safety meeting concerning the sports and our athletes, and it concerned nutrition, eating disorders, and mental health. And currently, as a district, we do not address any of those issues with our athletes. It's done through health classes 
but not necessarily with our athletes. And it's something that the safety committee thought we needed to really focus on the wellness of our athletes and be proactive. So Mr. Rush was gonna reach out um, to Mrs. Lyons and try to get something going so that that can be brought to the forefront with our athletes coming from our coaches, not necessarily from our teachers, but from our coaches, because the coaches have a different relationship than they do with the teachers. Um, so we really want to be proactive with that, and hopefully that will be something that we can get going on um, in the near future. Kim, Judy, anything else? Kim? Okay, thank you. Move down the line. Mrs. Mallis, anything to make? Thank you. Mr. Cassidy? Thank you, Mr. Blowers. Yes, the uh, finance committee met on December 2nd. Uh, Mr. Brunson and Mr. Daniel and I were uh, representing the board of that meeting. The superintendent was there at the school, business administrator, the assistant superintendent, and then the senior top clerk notated. But I do have some detailed minutes. I just want to highlight a few of the things quickly, and then because I know we have a budget presentation, but some items that uh, we consider at the committee level that may be very important as we move forward with the budget. The tentative calendar, the budget calendar was introduced. I think the board will see that tonight. Uh, talked uh, about the uh, building condition survey. The architects are working on that. And uh, certainly the financial piece of it was how will the type of tax levy down the road. And right now there's a, a plan in place to address that so there'd be no impact with new taxes on the upcoming budget. So there'll be a lot to that. But that was part of our, uh, our meeting. Um, we talked about uh, uh, having a board resolution presented to establish a new repair reserve. Uh, we'll certainly talk more about that. I see a lot of benefits in doing that. Uh, the committee did as well. But certainly we'll be talking about, talking about that more during the budget process. The uh, discussion about restoring um, funding uh, for field school field trips. As you know, the school district used to pay for transportation. Some costs related directly to field trips. Uh, during some of the troubling times of the budget, we, those costs were moved from the PTO to help pick them up. So we're considering at least recommending to the board funding field trips next year out of the uh, general fund budget. Uh, there's a discussion about kindergarten class size. Currently there's 22 students per class. And uh, Mr. Brunson asked for work well the information, which will be shared with the board of that. And then uh, there's concern about the space limitations at Parkdale uh, should we move forward with an uh, expansion of the pre-K program. So that was discussed. And uh, then adding a paying code for seven day to modify football, the committee certainly recommended that for health and safety reasons. And there were some other items, uh, some of those were brought up tonight or in the future budget program. Mr. Blowers. Mrs. Daniel, anything tonight? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Brunson. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, construction uh, committee uh, met uh, last month, uh, the day after our last school board meeting, and we met at the offices of Young and Wright, our new architects. Uh, Mr. Blowers was there, Mrs. Oldweiler, I believe, was there, and, and I was there. Uh, the, uh, we had good representation from the administration, from the school district, from the uh, architectural firm, and the, uh, uh, and the engineers as well. And, and our uh, financial advisor was, uh, was there. So it was a good meeting uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh, building condition survey and the possibility of the need for a future bond issue. Uh, associated with some additional work that needs to be done in the school, uh, in the, all three schools. Uh, we had a tour of Young and Wright's facilities, which are spectacular. They're a, it's a, 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 a malting uh, built, uh, plant that uh, has a grain elevator and has been converted into offices. And uh, if any of you have a chance to call, call them and make an appointment, go over and get a tour, I recommend. So uh, we're off to a good start with our new architects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunson. Uh, moving on to item seven, administrator comments. Are there any administrators who wish to address the board this evening? 
Mr. Moore, coming in from the back. Blocked by a large screen. Hello, um, so I left something. There we go. So I left something with each member of the board. Uh, so new program at the high school called the New York State Seal of Biliteracy. It's um, an opportunity for students who get to a college or uh, equivalent level of ability in both a foreign language and English. Um, so they can demonstrate that through AP or, or uh, region scores above an 85. And so if they, they do achieve in both languages, English and the foreign language, they get a seal on their diploma. Uh, New York State is one of 39 states that do this. So this, uh, this seal would be uh, relevant as they apply for universities across the country. So it's a cool new thing that we're starting this year. We've got about a half a dozen, six or eight students that are going to start this year with our first uh, first batch of students, and we're really excited to offer it. The load department, the foreign language department is awesome uh, as they as they sort of spearheaded getting this started and working through the process of what all the all the paperwork and all the, the, the components of the program need to be. So we're very excited to offer this to our students. Sure that is all I have, unless anyone has any questions about it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Lyra. Hello, everyone. I just want to let you know we got the band back together and the orchestra and the chorus and, and all the other musical performances. They were on stage the, the past two weeks. So we started with our second grade concerts and we moved all the way through uh, fourth grade uh, orchestra, chorus, um, and a little bit of band. They, they're just starting to learn the instruments then. So we got to see a little bit of a taste of, uh, of what they're going through in the classroom through a nice video that Mrs. Leibold put together. And then just the other night, we had our uh, middle schoolers here for their band performances, the symphonic band and the concert band. And uh, about a week ago, the, the, or the uh, excuse me, the chorus. So we had the, the whole slew of, of uh, the music department was, was here and uh, back live on stage. And it had been several years since the kids have performed live or even performed at all in front of anyone. So, um, and, and this was middle schoolers who, who haven't performed in front of, of anyone. So it's been that long since they've had a, an actual live performance on, on stage. So everybody was really excited. We had a great turnout at all of our shows. And I know the kids were really nervous at first, but really excited when they walked off stage uh, after the performances. So uh, so just wanted to let you know that, that uh, everything is up and running and we'll have more concerts in the spring if uh, we're unable to check it out this fall. Thank you. Mr. Lyra, uh, and I understand that is why we are taped off in the auditorium for the concerts. So that's great. Thank you. Any other administrators? Nothing this evening. Thank you. Moving on to the community comments portion of our board meeting, we had asked the district residents who wish to speak during the visitor comments portion of the board meeting had to complete a visitor comments card and deposit it in the box located at the sign in. Um, they were on board. We have only two this evening. The comment, community comments period, I remind you, is intended to be a dis, not to be a discussion with the board or a question and answer session. The Board of Education will listen to the remarks and may or may not respond directly to the speaker. The Board of Education will determine if a response from the board is warranted or if the matter should be directed to an appropriate administrator. Each speaker will be given three minutes to address the board and speakers may not yield any time to another speaker. No more than three speakers per topic. A uh, maximum of 30 minutes total. Speakers who have prepared written comments are encouraged to submit them to the board at any time. We welcome comments at boe at eak12.org. And we ask for those at least 24 hours prior to board meeting so board members can review the comments in advance of the meeting. In addition, any individual comments were to be submitted, uh, could be submitted in lieu of speaking. Individuals who participate in the visitor comments period must conduct themselves in a respectful manner. Shouting, outbursts, use of obscene language, or any other conduct that interferes with the meeting will not be permitted. And in the unlikely event the meeting becomes unruly, the board will recess the meeting and will return once order has been restored. All board members would should have received emails from Eric Derringer, DO, uh, requesting healthier food choices. Several emails from Unmasked New York Kids about anti-masking, uh, county mandates, vaccine mandates, and more on vaccines. Uh, an email from Becky Horning regarding policy updates 
and investigator Sharon Turlington regarding Western New York varsity, girls varsity ice hockey, an anonymous letter sent to the district office regarding local control and state mandates, Becky O'Connor regarding personal touch, Sean and Sarah McCloskey anti-masking vaccine mandates, Sean and Bryn Patterson regarding the Western New York girls varsity ice hockey, Sarah and Patrick Hornung um, were afforded a letter that was sent to Mrs. Pantova regarding the positive effects of UPK. Um, Sarah McCloskey, a document regarding lack of vaccine safety, and Don Janish regarding Western New York girls varsity ice hockey. Everyone received their emails. Yes, yes. Thank you all. Okay, uh, up first we have Don Mona. Mrs. Mona. No, Mrs. Mona. Okay. Evan Roden. Afternoon. Oh, yeah, turn that on. You can move it up too. Testing. So, um, hi, uh, I'd like to note before, before I start um, that a few hours ago, the United States passed a very grim milestone. 800,000 of my fellow Americans have passed away from COVID-19, including many in our community. Let's take a moment to contemplate them and offer our thoughts to their loved ones. I'm currently a student at Tulane University in New Orleans, pursuing a bachelor's and master's in biomedical engineering. Tulane has, up until recently, been, very, been doing a very excellent job at handling the pandemic. They've required all students, staff, and faculty get vaccinated, required the use of vaccine or masks indoors, and limited gathering sizes. Because of that, a campus with 10,000 students saw a consistently low case rate, about five per week, up until very recently. It was so successful that about two months ago, the mask mandate was removed and we didn't see a spike in cases. Two weeks ago though, Omicron was detected on campus and the measures in place to reduce the spread of the virus were not enough. We went from one or two positive tests each day to 105 and cases are growing exponentially. The doubling rate or the time it takes for the number of cases to double is less than two days right now. Contact tracers are overwhelmed, hospitals are operating fully at capacity, and the community is reeling. Just as the United States could learn from Italy when they were hit by the, vi by the virus a month prior to us, we squandered that opportunity. But East Aurora can learn from the spikes in cases occurring across the globe in places like South Africa, Botswana, and now New Orleans. The community can implement stronger measures to protect students, faculty, and the community at large. Among my age group, COVID-19 is more deadly than a number of diseases that we already have vaccine requirements for, like measles and varicella. We've been studying mRNA vaccines since 1999, and we've only had COVID under our microscopes for about two years. There's the potential that Omicron is less deadly and will lead to an increase in herd immunity as it spreads, but I don't feel comfortable using those that I love, those that I know, and my community as that experiment. I urge the board to continue requiring masks, keep protections in place that reduce community transmission and require the COVID-19 vaccine for eligible students in the 2022-2023 school year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now moving on to item nine, reports and discussion items, item A, Ms. George. Hi, good, good evening. Oh, by the way, we're there again. Good evening. Um, tonight, our financial reports are as of the end of October. And of note, in our general fund, at the end of October, we had $23.2 million in the bank, which ties to our uh, cash flow. And that is directly related to the collection of taxes. Um, we had spent approximately 18% of our budget 
and received 72%. The other fund of note is the C fund, our cafeteria fund. At the end of October, um, expenses exceeded revenues by a considerable amount, 43,000. Um, but that was a factor of our state and federal reimbursements. And I'm happy to report on November 29th and on December 2nd, we received approximately $122,000 in those reimbursements. So it was just a timing issue. And that is all I had for tonight. Are there any questions regarding our financial statements? Oh, Mr. Flowers, go ahead. Just a, just a more of a point of clarification before so break. The, uh, the A250 the general fund, I'm assuming that the um, unpaid school taxes as of 1031, uh, that, is it, that's the dollar amount that's in there? Yeah. As of 1030, correct. That yeah. has gone down significantly. Is that the only uh, money that's in the receivables is just the unpaid taxes or just something else? No, that's all that's in there. And then I just want to stick with the tax levy. Now on the revenue side, the, uh, the property tax levy and the star reimbursement. So the revenues are recorded in full for the local share of the property taxes and then the state's share for the star reimbursement. Is that correct? Correct. The, okay, and I'm just, uh, just a matter of cleanup. Can we do a revenue adjustment just for that 1 million, six, I guess I read it, 578 to do it? Probably you would increase the revenue budget for the star reimbursement and just reduce the property tax? Yes. I don't have an interest in doing that, but just might look a little simpler for the board. Okay, sure. And that, that's okay. We can obviously do that. But I have um, a question. So the way we're doing the county now it appears, if we have um, either correction of errors or an assessment reduction, and the tax levy gets reduced a little bit because the taxes were set in the budget. Are we doing that to the uh, to the reserve? So if we have a reduction in the tax levy during the current year, rather than go through the revenue, will we just charge that off to the tax territory reserve? Um, that reserve was specifically set up for a specific um, petition. Okay. Um, it, not for. It, for so a specific adjustments of hundred dollars or thousand dollars. Not for the small ones, correct? Yeah. Okay. I just wonder how we're going to use that. And then the, uh, the cash flow statements, which you have, is very well done, very helpful and stuff. It helps with our district the, the collection of the uh, star taxes and and the school tax and lottery come in early, so it certainly helps throughout the process. But the way you have it laid out is very well done. I just want to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Flowers, do any board members have any other questions or do you need to be caught up on any anything that Mr. Flowers just brought our attention to? Good. All right. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mangretti for our grid. Okay. Uh, the monthly budget grid is back in all its glory. Uh, last month, which was November, you only got the October column. Uh, Ms. George and I were able to catch us up, so we're back to real time. Um, I'm only going to read the December column and just remember that. The numbers in that column are referential back to the actual budget. They're not cumulative one way or the other. Um, and it's also kind of, and I know it feels like we've been here forever and we also just got here, it's early in the year. And what we do is project what we are confident is a savings in this document. And so you'll see a number of areas that's a zero uh, that, that doesn't mean anything other than um, we're not worried that we're over budget or worried that we're under budget or just chugging along. So I want to talk about salaries first of all. You'll see that salary is obviously the biggest chunk of our budget um, in terms of expenses. Uh, that number is a zero. That do not read into that. We believe that we are in a wonderful place with salaries. The reason that's a zero is a number of the salaries this year are being charged to some of the new grants that we've received, and we still have to do the final reconciling of what's a grant and what comes out of the general fund and the rest. Um, with the late January board meeting, our hope is to give you a good indication of where we are in terms of salaries at the January meeting, but we are not at all alarmed or concerned. We just didn't feel comfortable putting a number there until we do the accounting on the back end. Um, it's benefits, again, uh, trending in a very good direction, already looking to realize about 30,000 in savings. Um, that is a very conservative number. Uh, our, our health insurance runs from October to fire well, or the, we had health insurance for the whole year, but we paid for it from October to June. And the number of new hires 
Um, they're coming on to the rolls now. So again, in January, we'll have a better number of that. We're not at all concerned that, again, seems to be trending positive for us. Um, but we did put that placeholder there. That number will be more concrete um, as we get to the uh, January meeting, hopefully. Uh, equipment, again, we're right on track with where we were. Salaries, uh, contractual, textbook, software library, and ultimately tuition. Uh, those are, um, again, trending slightly positive. Um, nothing to write home about, but definitely not going in the wrong direction. Uh, BOCES, that number's going to stay out as a zero until the big special ed adjustment comes in February. Um, we got our initial bill, which was basically built for the services we bought. That big adjustment, which was the game changer, which caused this grid a, a good number of years ago, that number drops in February. So um, we're not worried about it, but ultimately the, the devil's in the details, and a lot of that is driven um, by special ed programming and the children who need those necessary services um, and deserve them. Uh, and then transportation, uh, as of now, we're, we're trending slightly in the good direction. That is conservative, obviously, keeping schools open five days a week uh, and the bus is running, the more stable that number becomes. If we have to do anything crazy, uh, God forbid, then obviously that number has the potential to swing. But um, the longer we stay open and do what we need to do, um, that number seems to be trending in a positive direction. Um, debt service transfers, that's the universal feeding. So in terms of revenue, the things we can control, we're about, I'm sorry, in terms of expenditures, uh, we're about 71,000 to the good. In terms of revenue, uh, we again now seem to be 87,000 to the good. Uh, remember, negatives are good on the top, positives are good on the bottom, bringing us to about $158,000 on your budget uh, as of right now. Uh, and then the next line down, the unappropriated, I'm sorry, the appropriated fund balance, that 418, that's that magic number that we roll over from one to the rest. So once that 158 hits 418, then we know we're in really good shape. Uh, the rest is the personnel numbers below that, and then the uh, historical accounting of what's in all of our reserves uh, falls out of the back page. Questions about the grid? Yes, please. Yes, Mr. Brassen. Uh, good morning. Jumping in. Thank you. Um, this is great. It, uh, again, I appreciate the work. It relates to the general fund budget, which is what we've always been concerned about year, year after year. I would just point out that on your back page, you have a little extra space down here at the bottom. I do. And, and I would appreciate uh, a, an update as time goes by when you feel comfortable being able to do it for the revenues and the expenditures associated with the uh, special aid uh, funds, the, uh, the federal monies. Uh, the, the, I'm not concerned about the, the little grants that are in there uh, mixed in, but, but I'm talking about these big dollar figures that are coming in from the, from the federal government, $3 million approximately. I, I'd like us to see, to track that money coming in and going out. And I don't think we need more than two lines on there, one for the revenues and one for the expenditures so we can see what we're taking in and how we're spending. If I may, I'm going to defer my response to you and see if anyone else has a um, comment on the grid, uh, because it seems that uh, Santa may have come early for you, Mr. Brunson, because guess what my next sheet of paper is? That uh, exact thing. Uh, anyone else have any comments on the grid itself? OK, so um, Mrs. Marinaccio uh, saw how much fun Miss George and I have doing this grid each year, and so she uh, was voluntold to do the exact report that Mr. Brunson uh, has just asked about. So I'm going to come hand out that report. It is far more extensive than what you suggest, and I'm glad you're looking for less because it was a beast to manage. Um, but this will at least be a good introduction for you and for the board on that very topic. And then if we can get some feedback on how we can streamline that, because this was a, a bear to put together. So, Ms. Marnoff, Jim. Oh, wait a second. So, Mr. Member, to get the chance to hand that out so everybody can see what I'm referring to as we're talking. Um, as you can see, it's three pages, so it's a lot more than two lines. I'm not even quite sure how many lines are on here. And as Mr. Membretti mentioned, it was quite a fair for Mrs. George to put together. Um, but hopefully it's in a format that's easily understandable for everybody. Um, there is a key in the top left corner. The gray lines really just break up the, um, split up the grant sources because there are two different grants, the CRRSA, and then there's the ARP grant. Um, the CRRSA is actually made up of two parts, though. There's an ESSER and a GEAR that go with that. 
So it looks like there's three separate grants here, but there's really just two. One's broken into two parts. The yellow um, that looks like highlighting, that's the revenue. Okay, that's the revenue that's come in to date so far. Um, and then because both of these grants are grants over several years, so the CRRSA, we have until September of 2023 to spend that money, and the ARP, we have until September of 2024 to spend that money. So in addition to just listing everything, we broke it down by the expenditures per year, so you have an idea as to what the money's being spent on each year. The, we've provided more like in the past broad categories of where the money is going to be spent, and those are really based on the guidelines that we were given for where the money can be spent. This isn't just money to spend wherever you want for you know construction or things like that. They had strict guidelines. And one of the grants, 20% of that had to be withheld for loss of learning. And that's where we had spent some of the money this year for the summer skills camp. And we have money allocated for that again for next year. If you take a look at um, the different categories, I think it's broken down very specifically for you. Um, the broad categories where we had like social emotional learning, technology, um, professional development, summer learning. You can see where more specifically in each of these lines where that money is being spent, and where um, we've actually spent some of it already of what's come in. So you'll notice, I believe, on the second page, so the CRRSA, we've received at this point 304, almost $305,000 of that. And what's in red is what's been spent to date. Um, the ARP, we have not received any of those funds yet. And the other, the CRRSA, the gear, portion of it, we've received um, almost $33,000 so far. So at this point, I'm not sure if you want me to go into any additional detail or if you have any questions regarding the grants and the spending. Um, I should mention that um, we have not received state approval yet. So when we do receive state approval, my understanding is one of the requirements is that the grant itself and the FS10s, the budgets, have to be posted on our website. So just um, the state has told us that that is going to be one of the requirements. I know districts that have already been approved, theirs already has been posted. Do board members have questions at this point? Do we have any idea when we might get approved? Um, I think it's like a rolling basis. So whenever the state gets through all of them, that's when ours will get approved. So since some in our area are, have been approved already, I've heard, I'm assuming we're probably somewhere in the queue. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate you doing this. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, uh, and, and it is more detailed than I needed to see. But, I, but more is it's always better. Yes. So the, but moving forward, rather than make work for you, if, if you could just uh, summarize mm -hmm. the revenues and the expenditures, we can always look back to this to see where the specifics are. And Correct. maybe that'll make it a little easier for reporting to the board. Okay, and the other thing to keep in mind is once we do receive approval, this money is to be spent over a couple of years. So you can imagine there will be some changes and that may take place. Um, if not what we thought was going to be spent on something, it could then be spent on something different. So we will have to submit amendments to the state for any any changes in spending over a couple of years too. This, this will just... help us though with regard to, we're, we're appointing several new positions tonight. And, and yes. some of those are funded through, through this month. And so uh, it'll help us to uh, guide us as we move forward to commit to these folks that we're sure that uh, in future budgets, when that three years is up, we will be able to continue to employ uh, the, the, the people that we've hired. So, uh, so the, I think it's important that we as a board monitor this. Yes, and as Edmund, we did, as we put everything together, definitely kept that in mind because we know that the board feels very strongly about that, about the sustainability of positions.
Thank you very much. Um, I, I would suggest that whatever, thank you so much for all of this information. It's fantastic. And, and as we come up to speed, it was really great to have the deep dive. I would suggest that whatever way going forward, you've heard um, Mr. Brunson's request and we can see what other board members would like to see. If continuing with this form is easiest for you since you've already built it, please go forth, but whatever, no, okay. <laughs> whatever Whatever's easier for you, this is a great okay. educational piece and, and thank you. Um, and it's it's very good to see the um, the different elements that go into it. The, where the funding comes in, it looks like funding is coming in some places before we've spent it and not in other places where we've already spent it. So if you could help us maintain that level of understanding going forward, that would be fantastic. We will definitely try. Thank you, Mrs. Daniel. And I was going to say, this is extremely helpful and I think it's just important for people to understand, even though our grants, if I'm understanding this correctly, are approximately $3 million. At yeah. this juncture, we've received, just looking quickly, only around 300 and thirty-seven thousand dollars in right. that in that money, correct? Yes, that's okay. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Financial, just two things to highlight on that. Um, to Ms. Olawa's question, sometimes it gets stuck in the queue. This is a queue that seems to be moving along, and things are getting approved. So it's not one of those things that's kind of hanging out there in the ether. That it is coming, um, but you never know when it comes until it shows up. But it, there seems to be some momentum behind it. Um, again, it comes in these drips and drabs of you never know what you're going to get, um, but it's not like we're not going to see this money for seven years or the money's being denied. Um, there are some tweaks. The other thing, just to highlight the difference between Ms. Marinaccio's grid and my grid, just to remember, my grid is always going to be projections based on our budgeting guesses, educated guesses. This grid will always just be actual, so it's whatever is in or whatever is out will be on that grid. So when we do put them on the same sheet, I will make that note that the top half of the sheet is is educated guesstimates, and the bottom half of the sheet will just be literally what's coming in, what's not. Thank you. Thank Other board you. members? If I could just say one comment, I think um, this is really great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Nacho, for putting this together, and it's very thorough. And I think, like you said, for the board, you can really see all the elements, uh, and we can make it available to uh, on the website. Uh, so it looks all the elements that we're considering, right? But it, it, as we go through this process, you know, we decide if we need a certain position or a certain piece of equipment. Some of them we do, and then some of them we don't. So then we make adjustments and, and rework the budget. So it's kind of a work in progress. So there's there's a combination of both ongoing expenses, which are related primarily to the positions, and then you can see there's technology and other items that we're purchasing that are one-time expenses. So the, the, the budget here is a combination of those two. So where we're going to be focusing on is, as Mr. Marinaccio said, the long-term sustainability of those positions. And so working closely with Mrs. George uh, about like how are we going to build that into the budget over the next three years to keep those things in place. Very much. I think we are moving on to item B again, Ms. George, with the final budget development calendar. Yes. You should have had a, a final budget cal calendar in your packet. Um, I did not receive any feedback to make adjustments. Um, we did discuss possibly adding a some type of community forum at some point in the future. We're not sure exactly what we're going to do with that yet, um, but that may be coming down the pipe. Are there any questions? Questions or need time to digest? No questions at the moment. Thank you. I think we're on to item C plans for development of said budget. Mr. Rice. Okay, so um, I'd just like to welcome everybody to the first round of our budget presentation. And the first one out of the gate typically is, is, is just. Uh, general overview of what we're thinking for the year, and then we'll have some discussion with the board about how we'd like to move forward in terms of the budget development. So here it is, uh, again, our agenda, our commitment to crafting a vision that aligns with our values. That's been kind of a central focus for about the last five or six years now. Uh, finance committee update. The finance committee has been meeting uh, and making some good progress, so we'll have an update on that. Our per pupil expenditure comparison, I also like to know how much money we're spending per pupil on kind of the bang we get for our buck. Uh, budget development considerations, 
the Register Development Calendar that Mrs. George just went over, and then we'll lead to our discussion. Again, uh, pretty straightforward. So here it is. It's I like this. Uh, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. And again, you know, the values and vision have been driving us since we attended the Leadership Institute at Disney. Uh, and I think it's been really valuable to keep us focused on the needs of our students uh, and our faculty and staff. Here it is. Uh, again, this is developed by one of our art teachers, Ron Van Ostrand, and it shows the, the four values for the district that are on the leaves. And then the exploration, growth, opportunity, and innovation are those elements that we think about as we're developing our programs and creating opportunities for our students. So our commitment, again, we are wavering in our commitment to serving the interests of our students as identified by our professional, the professionals entrusted with their care. We are committed to exercising good care and judgment and managing the resources with which we are entrusted by our community. We are committed to conducting our business in an open, objective, and professional manner. And we are committed to constant improvement by articulation of a future-focused vision that is always aligned to our timeless values. Again, here it is. This is kind of the driving force behind our decisions as we're just getting started. It seems like uh, the budget cycle almost never ends. <laughs> You know, you're, it's, 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 it's an ongoing process for sure. So here it is, a tricky triangle uh, for budgeting. You know, we look at uh, identifying our priorities, balancing trade-offs, and then priority goals. And so, you know, we're thinking about what our goals are, we identify what that is, and then what's the trade-off as we go through the process of balancing uh, the amount of money that we're asking our, our constituents to support, what we have in our current uh, general fund, how we can use those monies to, to maximize the effect uh, on our programs and students. Budget Finance Committee. Uh, we started meeting in October, and, and this is where we start talking about budget development. Uh, and again, we have a few meetings prior to this meeting so that we have some conversations. We look at our Moody's rating, uh, which is A1, which is great. Uh, that dropped off for a little bit, but it's about back in place uh, now. Uh, capital Project Timeline, you know, we're working um, with our new architects on our next uh, capital facilities. And we're really trying to, to time that as money is falling off within the general fund to minimize the impact on our taxpayers. A FEMA update, the submissions uh, number one and number two, uh, we're really hoping that those FEMA claims come in. Uh, we're still waiting on most of that. Let me stretch up. And the CARES, uh, CARES Act update, which uh, Joanne shared a little bit with you, and so Mrs. Marinaccio. Uh, and the tax levy limit, we take a look at what the early projections are and, and where we think it may may end up. In December, uh, again, we solidify the budget calendar. Uh, we review the architect and building condition survey. Right now, the um, the architects have been working on a building condition survey, which we're required to do every five years. Uh, the new architects have a really thorough process that is computerized, and so that will be a really valuable tool for our buildings and grounds uh, team to use because they'll be able to access it on a moment's notice. Tax, uh, the tax levy limit, there's a new projection with updated uh, tax-based growth factors. So we get information every month, and that helps us to tighten up the, uh, the predictions uh, as we move toward May. And then found, uh, foundation aid projections and review. Last year, um, foundation aid started running again. We've been waiting for, gosh, more than a decade. Uh, so it's finally in motion, and that's that's what's so important about the foundation aid, as, as you're most aware of, is that it's money that is like predictable that we can count on year to year. Unless, of course, they change the formula, which I don't think they're going to do. So we're pretty excited that that money is going to be coming to us. We got a payment uh, this this year. Uh, we'll be getting one for 21, 22, no, 22, 23, and then 23, 24. Here's our account, uh, accountability uh, supplements per pupil expenditure. We always like to take a look at where we are and, and, and how much money we're spending on our students uh, as comparison is uh, districts across the state. Uh, you can see ours East Aurora, uh, there's about eight, a little over $8,000 for general education and a little over $28,000 for special education. Similar districts to ours in terms of demographics, they're spending about $15,400 for general ed and $41,300 for special ed. And then the average for all districts across the state uh, is $13,370 for gen ed and then $32,280 for special ed. So you can see here, you know, we're keeping our expenditures in line. We continue to be far below the average uh, for similar districts and uh, just districts across the 700 districts across the state. So we're always pretty proud of this. And here we are at the budget development calendar. I won't go through it again. Mrs. George just 
Talk to us about that. You know, the one thing I think we talked a little bit about is, is having some kind of uh, public forum, which we can discuss as we move through the process, pick a date that works for everyone. And uh, again, we, you know, every month we'll come back in September, there'll be a budget workshop. We're really hoping we push off the January meeting a little bit, because usually in the middle of January, we get some information from the state that helps us then to make better predictions uh, at that meeting on the 27th. Uh, then we'll continue in February, uh, March, it really kicks in. You can see that we have uh, two and then three right in a row, March 9th, 24th, and uh, April 6th. And we adopt the, the school district budget and property tax report card on the 21st of April to submit it the next day. The 27th budget to, uh, document is available. We hold the hearing on the 4th of May and on the 17th is the vote. And that's for every school district across the state, May 17th. And that will be here before we know, right? Uh, time's really fun, flying by. So um, now I'll just open it up to questions. Board members with questions? Brian, are we are we going to continue with our um, our three year plan? Will that be coming out when we start this process? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. We'll we'll continue and to evaluate what we've been able to add programs we've been able to restore, the, uh, the scheduling, how that's working at the high school, you know, what, how do we need to support that if we have enough staff in place? I mean, one thing that's really been helpful is the federal funds. It's allowed us to, to, to move forward with some of those, um, those objectives that we've had over the last few years. And so again, the, the, the trick to it is going to be the planning to sustain them. Um, not all the positions may need to be sustained. Again, we're going to evaluate what our kids need. And then from that, we'll develop what staff we can have in place. Would we expect for the January 27th meeting, then we would have the we re 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 rekindle the list that we've had going for the few years, and maybe you can fill us in on what you're seeing as ongoing needs, or some of those may have. Yep, sure. So we'll, we'll, we'll have we'll have a much more extensive report in January, um, sort of similar to what we what we've done in the past. So here's what we've been able to accomplish over the last two to three years. Here's where we are this year. And here's what we're hoping to add now and then in the future. Other board member comments or questions? All right. Thank you. Anxiously waiting January 27th, apparently. Moving on to item D, Ms. Lyons, the assessment reports. the annual report that usually Mr. Membrady does on um, our assessment results from the Regents exams and the three through eight assessments from the spring of 2020. Um, a couple of considerations uh, as we look through these comparisons to uh, other districts in our area. Uh, all the assessments were one day instead of uh, usual two days. Uh, several years ago they were three days, they were cut down to two, but this year they were only one day for math and ELA. Um, on the ELA assessment, past assessment questions were actually used uh, in this, on the spring of 2021 exam, uh, some of which students had access to. So if teachers chose to uh, do some practice questions with their students, uh, they saw the same exact passages uh, a week, two weeks, three weeks later. Uh, everything was multiple choice. There was no short answer, and there was no extended response. Um, for math or ELA, everything was multiple choice. Uh, Regents exams were optional in spring of 2021, so I'm not presenting that data today. Uh, kids did not have to take them. Uh, no assessments were given in the spring of 2020, of course. And in the spring of 2021, 2021 for all the three through eight math and ELA assessments, they were all the computer-based version. Um, and to recall, back in 2019, we piloted the computer-based assessments with just grades four and five and the other four grade levels took them on paper. So this was the first time um, that four of these six grade levels actually took the state assessment on a computer. So there's little tips and tricks and stuff, but um, it was their first time. Uh, obviously we were in a hybrid learning model last year and um, most schools in the state were and everybody had a different hybrid model. 
And this last quote I took from um, the state ad releases the assessment scores. They send a memo telling you that they're available. And they also put this little disclaimer in there. Uh, state assessments are not representative of the state's student population, and the results should not be compared statewide or by statewide subgroups. Which is like, I'm, I'm going to compare us right now. Yeah, we do do very well, but just things to keep in mind as we go through this uh, presentation for our assessments. Right here in this little table, uh, this is how, uh, what the percentage of our students that took the ELA and math assessment in grades um, three through eight. And it goes down drastically from third grade to eighth grade. And students either opted, their parents opted them out, or if students were all virtual last year, they did not have to come in to take the assessment. Uh, they had the option, but not everybody chose to do that. Um, and just a reminder, as you all know, uh, we collect all kinds of data uh, to use it to um, continually monitor our students' uh, academic successes. So the state assessments is just one little snapshot. We use uh, some third-party diagnostic assessments. Uh, we have, obviously, teacher-created assessments, formative and summative, uh, common midterms, uh, common and summative assessments, uh, teacher observations, you know, anecdotal notes of how students are doing, and then any other data brought to the student support team. So this is just one snapshot and lots of different data that we look at. So this first graph is just um, our own students' data. It's how our students performed on the three through eight math and ELA assessments, and it's the percent proficient. So it's the percent of the students who took it um, that scored a three or a four. And then this next one is us compared to all the districts in Erie to OC. So these graphs you have, some of you have seen before. Um, the gray, the gray area is for the range of score of, of um, the scores, meaning the percent of kids that were proficient, and the um, red or brown line, it depends how you're looking at it, is the average, and the blue dot is us. Those other little dimmed out blue dots are the other districts in Erie Two Bosies. And then this is East Aurora measured against all of the districts in Erie 1 and Erie 2, so it's a larger snapshot. Again, we do outperform um, the average uh, in most subjects and grade levels, which I'll give you a summary at the end. And then against uh, us measured against every district in New York State, every public school, I should say, excluding the big five. And this is just for last year. And it's interesting to point out, you know, on the first slide, our eighth grade math scores didn't look so hot with the percent proficient. But if you look at compared in the, the previous two slides, too, we did quite well compared to the average for area, area two, area one and two, and the state. And then, as you know, Business First does rank the schools in Western New York every year. They did not rank them last year. So this is us compared to the top 15 districts uh, before the pandemic, so pre-pandemic. And the districts listed are at the bottom there. And again, where we fall um, compared to those top 15 you know, from the spring of 2021. This next one is a two-year trend uh, versus the region, which the region is Area 1 and Area 2, um, districts at Area 1 and Area 2. And um, the two years aren't consecutive because they weren't offered in 2020. So this is a measure of the curriculum, not the cohort. And then again, where we um, perform. This one was, I presented this about 10 times to all the teachers in grades through three. And it's interesting, the um, average from 19, 2019 to 2021 for all of the ELA exams uh, has increased. So all of the kids are overall did better in 2021 than they did in 2019. And for the most part, we're staying with the trend. And um, we don't think they got a better learning experience in 2021. We think it's because those released questions were on the assessment. <laughs> and then for math, <clears throat> the same graph, but for math, the two-year trend. Again, the average score regionally did go down from 2019 to 
Then the last couple of slides, um, there's three more charts here. Is, uh, this next one is the performance on the ELA assessment of students with disabilities compared to the districts in Area 1 and Area 2. And in, overall, in general, we do do a good job of supporting our students with disabilities, um, even during the um, pandemic, when it was a little more difficult and we had to get a little more creative. And then the same thing, but uh, for math performance, And again, this this is I was I have the numbers here if anybody's actually interested, but you know this might be anywhere from six kids to maybe fifteen. Like we're not talking about a large group of kids uh, because there is that group that opted out or were all virtual. Um, so this is a very small sample size. And then finally, the performance of students from low income households uh, for ELA math in twenty twenty one. And again, we, um, they did pretty well. And I think this uh, group of kids we were maybe a little more worried about uh, during the hybrid model, just not having the supports at home um, that some other students may have. But again, uh, they did it uh, very well. So just, there was a lot of numbers and a lot of blue dots starting at you. So just a couple highlights. Uh, we do, uh, we did exceed the regional or state average in 10 of 12 subjects and grade levels. And where I got the number 12 is um, grades three through eight is, are, is six grade levels, and there's uh, two subjects per grade level. So the overall, we did exceed um, in 10 of the 12 subjects and grade levels, the average, and in nine out of the 12 in performance of uh, economically disadvantaged youth. We had significantly strong performance of our students with disabilities. Again, we exceeded the regional average in 11 of the 12. Uh, third grade math continues uh, to be a, a shining star. Uh, they were a couple years ago, the last time we did this uh, presentation. They outperformed all districts in the Area 2 BOCES region, and they were the second highest in the combined Area 1, Area 2 region, and in the business first top uh, 15. And then again, I mentioned it at the beginning, and I'll mention it at the end here, we do use multiple sources of data. Uh, this is just a measure, but it's not the measure, especially uh, during the pandemic in the spring of 2021. And then just some things that we are focusing on this year. Um, while we're not comparing ourselves to uh, districts statewide, we have been having data meetings. Uh, I met with K-4 math teachers, K-4 ELA teachers in the middle school math and middle school ELA, and we are really just focusing on our own students' data and digging in a little deeper to see what questions um, maybe they didn't do so well on and seeing what answer choice they picked and like say the answer was A and 30 kids picked B, you know, kind of really digging in and um, trying to understand why they picked the wrong answer. Or if everybody did poorly on a question, um, just trying to figure out and talk about, think about their own thought process um, and really focusing on that this year. Um, in these meetings, and we'll continue on, it's the ELA review year. So these meetings uh, in the Ames Web and the FastBridge data you know, drive our curriculum and instruction. So this year is the ELA review year and next year is the math review year. So um, we'll use these meetings and data uh, moving forward. And current interventions that the board uh, has supported over the last couple of years that is assisting, in our, that's assisting our students academically is um, a couple of years ago, a middle school math lab was instituted where the, um, the teachers who teach math don't have a study, don't have study hall kids assigned to them but instead they have um, kids coming get extra help in math. And we did start that a couple years ago, but I think with the hybrid model and the pandemic, we have to give it a couple more years to show its effects. And this past year, we did add a 0.5 math teacher, at, uh, AIS teacher at Parkdale, and a 0.4 at the middle school. And what I also forgot to add on here that I just remembered is uh, our posting just closed for a uh, literacy specialist at Parkdale. So they're gonna, um, focus on tier three interventions with some of our media students. We're just finding the two current ELA AIS teachers. Uh, it's hard for them to do all their groups at the grade level and fit in tier three um, in a very specific time of the day when they do have the time. So between those two and the new literacy specialists, we're hoping to offer some more tier three um, interventions for students. Are there any thoughts or comments? 
Thank you, Mrs. Daniel. Um, thank you very much for this report. Just looking through it, obviously saw a significant drop off in terms of the number of students taking the test in the older grades. Could that, to some extent, explain some of the discrepancy between the scores in our seventh and eighth grade math classes? It just, I mean, as you look at the chart, clearly the students, the younger students, were were more proficient at least in this, and they were having a, a larger number of students taking it. I'm just trying to to understand why there's such a, a difference between our seventh and eighth grade proficiency as opposed to some of the younger students. Um, yes, I think that's any smaller sample size when you're doing any sort of data, the, it's, not, it's not as reliable as it might be with a larger sample size for anything you do. So I think that has to do with it. Um, but you mentioned eighth grade math. So yes, only at what, 21, 22% of our kids were proficient. But the whole state average, if I do against area two BOCES, the average in area two BOCES was only eleven percent. So I mean, it's so it's so skewed. Maybe it was a really difficult exam. So our kids did fairly well, though. You know, compared, even though that number seems low. So there, in middle school math, is something we're looking at and focusing on. We have already talked about a couple a couple of different avenues to take and uh, approaches to take this year. Hopefully, get our kids back on track with specifically five through eight math. To piggyback off um, Ms. Daniel's question, um, and this may go more to Mr. Brown, but we have the math lab that is in place. Um, are we having a lot of students attend these math labs daily, or is it something that's not being utilized? Yes, we have several daily. Um, it does vary on the day and on the grade, but um, typically, their home room or their study hall when I walk by is typically around 10 students, um, give or take a few, depending on the day of the grade. But yes, we're definitely utilizing them. Thank you. Other questions? I just wanted to make one comment on the tier three intervention. Um, you know, through uh, through media support, we it's tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier three being those students who have the greatest needs. Uh, and so, as 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 Ms. Lyons was saying, um, we've had some difficulties uh, attending to those needs because they are typically pretty intensive. So, the addition of of another reading specialist will allow us to provide that service, with the idea that will also diminish the need to refer to special education. And so we're really hoping that that will pay dividends in, in a variety of ways as we go forward. Yes, I don't know if um, did I put the time? Um, tier two is you know the typical AIS groups. Usually we try to keep it about four to six kids. So um, that's what we offer most of the day. We have an intervention block. And tier three is when students will get either one-on-one -on -one assistance from a teacher or two students to one, um, some sort of even more specialized instruction. So that's what we would like to offer to our to our media students, um, which we're hoping the literacy specialist will help help accomplish that. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Thank you Ms. Lyons. You're welcome. Thank you. Moving on to our enrollment report, Ms. Marinaccio. So the enrollment report that I'm presenting tonight really is just a small portion of what would have been the pupil services report. So it really is just a couple slides. You did receive already the actual enrollment report that we have done by Middle Cities Education Association. It was a little bit delayed this year because they were waiting on birth data from the county. And I think the county was busy with COVID and didn't get that data to them right away. So I apologize for being delayed. Um, so you did get the 21 page report. It was quite a massive report. And along with that was the interpretation guide that went with it. So I just want to talk about 
some of the information that I pulled out for the presentation tonight. Um, if you look at our student enrollment on the first slide from 2017, 2018 through the present, um, and 2017, 18, our total enrollment was 2,094, and this current year it's 1,901. Um, so the very top is our student enrollment in district K through 12, that's the top line. The second line is the EA residents that are parentally placed in private schools. And then we also have our homeschooled students. So adding those three together gives us our total student enrollment. I want to let you know that one thing that's not included in these numbers are UPK, because UPK is um, our enrollment for UPK is artificially capped. It's not all of the UPK students. We only have classes for 54 students. So it doesn't make sense to include those 54 in our enrollment numbers. And it hasn't been included in past years either. Okay. And then the next slide. So the first slide was really just our actual enrollments for those years. So the next slide is actually our um, actual enrollments for this year and two previous years. And then based on the study, the projected enrollment for the next three years. And I believe in the report, it goes out further than that. But for the presentation, I only included the next three years up through 2024, 2025. When that number is being calculated, it's based on the survival ratio is what they call it. And that doesn't mean life or death. That just means how many students continue from grade to grade in our district. <laughs> um, when you say survival ratio, you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> children dying, but that's not what that means. And it's also based on the birth rate in Erie County. So the birth rate in Erie County is one of the charts in the actual report. And you can see that just like our enrollment is trending down, the birth rate in Erie County is trending down. There were a few years, years ago, where it really peaked at like 10,000 something. And now the birth rate in Erie County has also gone down. So I think our enrollment sort of trends after that, and that's one of the things that's used to calculate our enrollment. I don't think there were any other things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, these numbers are based on bed stay. So, well, not the projected, the projected are a calculation, but the actual numbers for the years that are presented in the slides are based on bed stay because remember our enrollment changes is sometimes day to day. We have students that move in, we have students that move out, um, just it changes. Uh, the other thing is just like in Jess's report, we sort of caution about COVID because COVID, you know, even threw a wrench into enrollment. You notice in 2021, um, 2020, 2021, there were only 112 kindergarten students enrolled. We did have a lot of parents who chose to delay enrollment. And then that jumps up again this year back to 125. So that's a little bit higher than what it, you know, the previous year, but that's because of that delayed enrollment where some parents chose to delay. So COVID did have impacts here. And also there wasn't a lot of movement in and out of, you know, people buying homes, home building stopped also. So there were some things that could affect those numbers. Any questions on that? Or even about the larger report? Oh, one other thing. If you did read through the 21 page larger report and through the interpretation guide, there were three methods that were used for predicting enrollment. Uh, the numbers that I'm presenting tonight were based on method three. And they did present with the three methods, uh, the accuracy. And if you look, method two was actually the most accurate, but we chose to use method three because that combined method one and method two. Um, it was, wasn't as accurate as method two, but method two, they cautioned that that was just a one year, that was just based on one year worth of data and that things could affect that, such as closing a school or um, COVID. So we chose not to just choose method two, we used method three. So if you're reading through the large report and you're wondering where these numbers came from that I'm presenting tonight, it was method three. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions from Ms. Mary Nagio? 
Thank you. And if you read through the large report and you have other questions, you can reach out. Thanks. Moving on to item F, update on our district schools. Um, yes, yeah, so you know we continue to make progress. Um, I think um, one, of, one of the good things that we've seen over the last few weeks is I think I reported out last month that we were seeing a rise in some, some behavioral issues, primarily at the middle and high school, and uh, both principals are reporting that things seem to be leveling off and, and getting back to something that's more typical, especially at the middle school. Uh, you know, we're still seeing some issues related to um, like socio-emotional, mental health related issues that we're dealing with. Um, again, those are primarily at the middle and high school, um, but again, our team um, is working really well. Um, I'm preparing a notice for parents to let them know of all the people that we've been hiring to put in place to support uh, the social, uh, social emotional learning, as well as uh, the mental health uh, of our students and, and staff as well. Um, but overall, things are going well. You like uh, they reported out the concerts are back in place. So I've gotten a lot, I'll be honest, a lot of thank yous from parents that, you know, you, you, sometimes we take those things for granted. You know, we're going through our lives and, oh, yeah, it's a concert, I gotta go. We always enjoy it, right, because they're great. But when, 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 it, when you miss it for a year or two, then you realize how much you do enjoy it. And those rites of passage are, are really important to families and, and to our students. And so um, it's just great to see those things coming back again. High level of participation, winter sports are off to a good start. Uh, we've had, you know, the regulations continue to change, which is a bit, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, frustrating. Um, but, you know, we deal with it, and Mr. Excelling is doing a great job taking it day by day. And again, just uh, providing some really nice opportunities for, for our students. Yeah, so things are very positive. I don't know if the administrators have any comments at all. Uh, any comments from the board or questions? I just had one question, Brian. Um, if by chance we do have the need for a snow day, is it going to go back to how it used to be, where the kids stay home, or does it are we going virtual? I've had many parents ask me that question. How will we handle the snow day? And I can't believe I'm asking you that one tomorrow. It's supposed to be 63 degrees. <laughs> right. Yeah, right now, right, we're enjoying some nice weather. Um, yeah, it would probably be a typical snow day that we've, it, it, we've it, well, the students have enjoyed in the past for sure. Um, because again, to flip from like day to day from a live model to a remote model, um, it's really not as simple as, as it sounds. Right? You can't just flip a switch. There's a lot of equipment that's involved, um, you know, and to reset the, reset all of that up and, and have the teachers prepared to ship their lessons. On a, like basically on a moment's notice, it, it's really, um, uh, it's, it, it's just not that effective. Yeah, so we would be typically um, just taking snow days as we have in the past. Thank you, we've made a lot of kids happy, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Thank you very much. Moving on to the consensus items requiring board action, item number 11, item 11. I have a motion to approve the consensus items. Moved by Mrs. Daniel. Seconded by Mrs. Malice. All those in favor? I'm sorry, discussion? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Thank you. Moving on to item 12, items report requiring board action. Item A, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve the appointment of Christy Maziano. Ma sorry, Maison. I've done the wrong. Maizano, thank you. To a 1.0 FTE probationary position in the title of Director of Instruction and Information Technology in the tenure area of Director of Technology effective January 31st, 2022, as detailed in your agenda. May I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Silva. Second. Second by Mrs. Daniel. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7 0. Welcome. Congratulations. We're happy to have you. Yeah. Welcome aboard. Congratulations. Item B, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve the appointment of Tanya Tatino Yount to a probationary 1.0 FTE position in the tenure area of social school social worker beginning on January 18, 2022, as detailed in your agenda. I have a motion. Moved by Mr. Blowers. 
Seconded by Mr. Cassidy. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Thank you. Uh, item C, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve the appointment of Mary Chambers to a probationary 1.0 FTE position as behavior specialist in the tenure area of school psychologist beginning on January 18, 2022, as detailed in your agenda. May I have a motion? Moved by Mrs. Malice. Second? Seconded by Mrs. Daniel. Discussion? I was in, are we at Parkdale here, Brian? Let's run. K-12. K-12. Yeah, Ms. Mail says it will be somebody that works with all the teachers and, and the students K-12. Um, so it, it will be a pretty broad position. You know, we're going to kind of feel it out and see how it goes and, and make some determinations going forward. Verifying further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Item D, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve the district-wide emergency response plan dated July 2021 and presented at the public hearing held on November 17th. May I have a motion? Moved by Mrs. Oweiler. Aye. Seconded by Mr. Flowers. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Item E, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education approve for first reading and waive the second reading, adopt the following board policies. Policy 3140, flag display. Policy 7131, education of students in temporary housing. Policy 7221, participation in graduation ceremonies and activities. And policy 7440, student voter registration and pre-registration. I have a motion. Moved by Mr. Cassidy. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Daniel. Discussion? Yes, please. Mr. Uh, Watson. Question about 7131, the education of students in temporary housing. That's a 14 page policy. Uh, Mr. Russ, are we, are we sure that uh, we're prepared to implement this policy in, a, in the way that it's intended? Yeah, yes. So, so when those types of situations present themselves, um, it's not very often. Um, so we refer to the policy uh, to make sure that we're, we're, we're following the proper procedure. Yeah. So we're, we're, in other words, we're doing this already for a very few students. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. Yes, very few. Okay. And uh, next, uh, the uh, one on voter registration. I know in the past we've uh, pair, uh, we, uh, partnered with the League of Women Voters to do some voter registration uh, at the high school. Uh, and um, uh, I noticed that at the bottom of that policy, there's an indicator that allows you to, uh, to supplement this very short list of people that would help with, uh, with it. So I would encourage us to continue to, uh, to look to partners such as the League of Women Voters, not exclusively them, but uh, to, uh, to implement this policy. Good idea. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Brunson. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to item F, the superintendent recommends that the Board of Education discontinue the probationary period and terminate the employment of Colin Shoemaker, high school English teacher, effective January 14th, 2022. May I have a motion? Moved by Mr. Cassidy. Second. Seconded by Mr. Brunson. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Thank you. Item G, may I have a motion to approve the defense and, indemnic <laughs> defense and indemnification of the superintendent, Brian Russ, and assistant superintendent, Mark Membretti, as detailed in your attachment. May I have moved by Mr. Cassidy? Seconded by Mrs. Malice. 
Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Thank you. Item 13, items of information. The next regularly scheduled board meeting is Thursday, January 27th. We will have an executive session on next week, Wednesday morning. Currently executive session only at 7.15 in the morning. And you will see a list of meetings, workshops, and conferences listed in your agenda. Is there any other inf uh, information to come forward for? Thank you very much. May I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Mrs. Daniels, seconded by Mr. Cassidy. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried 7-0. Thank you very much.